Welcome to our next installment of Ask a Pastor, where we as pastors at Cornerstone seek to answer some of the questions that you may have in this format. We are now at part three of our little three-part mini-series answering questions about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Today we're going to be talking about remarriage. As we said in the last one, if you haven't seen the first one, make sure you go back and watch that one. I would commend that you watch that one at least twice as much as you watch the others. The Bible speaks of marriage from Genesis to Revelation. It is an ocean of content and of blessing and of goodness, of God's glory and the picture of Christ and the church, his permanent love. Marriage is massive throughout all of the scriptures. That is the ocean in which we swim. Divorce and remarriage are addressed in the scriptures, but those are more the streams on the, on the side. Those are smaller conversations, and we tend to get it wrong. When we ask about marriage, we often mean, I want to ask about divorce, and I want to ask about remarriage, and we want to have our emphasis correct that we do not treat our marriages or any marriage lightly or uh, as a way that there's all kinds of big highways to get out of when troubles come up. We do not want to dishonor God. Uh, his word, or the picture that he has given us in marriage of the permanent love between Christ and his church. We do not want to mar that. We want to take that very caref uh, very uh, seriously. So go back and watch the first one. And the last one was about um, divorce, and we introduced where some of the exception clauses are, and we're going to talk a bit about those today in the context of remarriage. So remember, divorce is sometimes allowed in specific situation because of the sinfulness of man. Divorce is never mandated. It is never a rule. It is sometimes allowed, and it is allowed because of the sinfulness, the hard-heartedness of man. It is not good. God hates divorce. It is violent, and we want to keep remembering that. But there are times we have seen where marriage has been robbed because of sin, of the glory of God to the point where God allows divorce to happen, where the whole image, the whole picture, the whole purpose of marriage has been utterly destroyed and God allows divorce to happen so that he does not punish the innocent party on those few occasions. We want to take that very seriously and be reminded of that. So we want to look through these two passages where the argument goes, the First Corinthians passage and the Matthew uh, 19 passage. If you don't have your Bibles, pause the video, Go get your Bible, and uh, we'll open up the scriptures, and we'll walk through these two passages together. And as we look at them, we're going to see that the two passages mirror each other. The arguments are identical. The structure, the framework in which this is all seen is exactly the same in the Matthew passage as it is in the Corinthians passage. So let's turn then to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7, I'm going to read verses 10 to 16. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord, meaning uh, Jesus spoke specifically to this topic. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, meaning Jesus did not address this specifically during his ministry, but Paul is going to address it now that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Paul introduces us to two different groups of people. And both groups are married. He is not talking to married people and single people. He is talking to Mary. Now, this is really important uh, to note. In verse 10, he says, To the married, I give this charge. He's talking to married people. And then in verse 12, he says, To the rest, 
but he does not mean to unmarried because he's still talking about divorce. He's still talking to married people. There are two groups of married people that are in view and they are separated by something. There is some component that he's going to separate and he says, I'm talking to this married group and whoever does not fall into that married group falls into this married group. There are two married groups that Paul is addressing here. So the first one, he says simply, do not divorce. You must not divorce. So to the married, you should not separate. And if you do, if you, if you break that command and you get divorced, Paul says you are still bound to one another. That was an unlawful divorce. You may not get remarried. He says there plainly, then you stay single or you get reconciled. To this group of married people, the Lord has said, no, you may not divorce. And if you go ahead and do it anyway, you are not free to remarry. The Lord still considers you bound to that spouse that you left. You are bound. You remain single or you get reconciled, but you have no license from the Lord to get remarried. This first group is held together by that permanent bond of marriage. Then he moves on to the second group. And the second group is different in that he's going to say they are not bound. They are not tied to the marriage in these cases. And what are those cases? Well, we read it here. In the case of an unbeliever who abandons their spouse. So the first one are for the other cases. You're not allowed to get divorced. Marriage is holy and you are meant to hold it together as that picture. And then he says to this other group, when there is an unbelieving spouse that abandons the marriage, they want to leave. He says that that group is not bound. The believer in that situation, be at peace, let them go. The Lord does not bind you to that marriage. That's the difference between the two groups. That's the difference. The one, you are not allowed to remarry. The other one, you are no longer bound, implying that you can remarry. In the context of the passage, he's talking about divorce and remarriage. If you follow that, if you look at that passage, the first group, he says, do not divorce, but if you do, you cannot remarry. He's talking about divorce and remarriage. And then in the second group, he addresses them. You are allowed to let the unbelieving spouse go, the abandonment. You are called to live at peace. The Lord does not bind you to that marriage. In the context of the passage then, Paul is talking about divorce and remarriage in both groups of people. To those who are bound together, they are to stay bound together, but to the rest, in the case of an unbeliever abandoning their spouse, the Lord does not bind you to that marriage. That is the flow of the argument in, um, in 1 Corinthians, two separate groups. So now let's turn over to the Matthew 19 passage, Matthew 19, verse 9. We're going to find that these two passages, they mirror one another. The flow of thought, the argument that Jesus has is the same that Paul is going to take each in their way. They are the same flow of thought. So let's look at Matthew 19, verse 9. Jesus says this, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So earlier in the passage, Jesus starts in the same way that Paul does. What God has joined together, let man not separate. This is the first group that Paul addresses, right? And he says, I say this to you, yet not I, but the Lord. Jesus has addressed this. What God has joined together, do not separate. This first group of married people may not divorce. And Paul says, if they do, you have to be single or be reconciled. You are not free to remarry. And Jesus is affirming the same principle. Marriage is holy. It is a union blessed by God and it is meant to be permanent. And then just as Paul moves over to the exception clause of the unbelieving partner desiring to leave and that person is no longer bound, Jesus does the same in this exception clause here, verse 9. He says, I say to you, this is the next group, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. It would make no sense to say that the man who divorces his wife, commits adultery. He doesn't commit adultery unless he marries another. Jesus is making a distinction between the sexually immoral as being the cause for the divorce or for any other reason. He is, he is pointing out the sin. He is going after the guilty in this one, the sexually immoral. They may not remarry. They don't have license. That is the sin and that is the guilt that is theirs. 
if there is a divorce based on the sexual immorality of another partner, this person is not bound. Just like in Corinthians, the person is not bound, the innocent party. The guilty are guilty, and they are held to account, and the innocent are not bound. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. There's the exception clause, adultery and abandonment. These are the two flows of thought that mirror each other. The exceptions in both cases for the innocent party is for the innocent party who has divorced over the unfaithfulness of their partner. God protects the innocent. This is allowed. The charge of adultery in remarriage that Jesus is making here does not apply to the innocent party. They are innocent. And in such cases, God allows for the remarriage. The exact same pattern. Unlawful divorce is sinful. Remarriage is not allowed. In the case of lawful divorce, the innocent party is not bound, meaning they are not sinning by getting remarried. The exception clause refers to the remarriage as much as it does the divorce. Now, in many situations, many situations, there is no innocent party. Oftentimes, it is both that have fallen into sin and rebellion. And there the message is clear. You don't have license to divorce. You are to stay bound to one another and work on repentance and forgiveness. It is these two clauses that are allowed. These are the streams of thought that um, God has allowed because of the hardness of heart. When the image and the glory of marriage, what is intended to portray about the love of God, when that is damaged to that extent, where an unbelieving spouse abandons the partner, or when someone betrays the partner by engaging in sexual morality, the glory of marriage is departed, Ichabod. It is gone. And in those situations, God does not punish the innocent party. He allows for divorce. And if we read it that way, the two passages are in harmony. And this is how we can say that God hates divorce, but he allows it for two reasons, in order to protect his own glory and to protect the innocent. God's glory is honored. He does not allow his name to be honored, and nor does he punish the innocent. God hates divorce. Sin is always involved, but there is not always equal guilt that is shared. So these exception clauses, if that ever crosses your mind and you struggle with that, do not take these videos as the be-all and end-all. You need to come under the word and be examined and to walk through all of these kinds of things. God will not let his glory be damaged, and he does not condemn the innocent. Now, I know there's going to be more questions that come out of all of this, and that's okay. What we are trying to do is create some foundational pieces that we can work on that are faithful to the scriptures as we seek to apply it faithfully in our lives and in our marriages as we move forward. So go back, watch that first video on the permanence and the purpose of marriage. That's the ocean in which we swim. That's what we want to guard. Divorce is never commanded. There is always hope. There is always hope and we want to grasp every little bit of the goodness that God has for us in marriage and never let that go or treat it lightly. Watch that one again. Swim in the oceans of the permanent love of God that God has for his people. We will wrap that one up right there. Send in your questions and we can keep the conversation going and we'll see you in the next Ask a Pastor.